use this today, brother. I appreciate you, Ben. Uh, but we've been going through, uh-oh, let's make sure this puppy's up. We've been going through some of our founding vision, some of those core principles and core values, worship, community, service, and we've been taking time each week to pray and just to spend time lifting up our various needs to the Lord. And so we're going to continue on with that today. But before we jump into the message and then our time of prayer, I do want to mention a couple of things that are coming up here soon for us as a church family. First off, I'm not going to be here next Sunday or the following Sunday. I'm going to be leaving Thursday along with Hunter and Chelsea Vasquez, and we're going to be heading to Tanzania. Uh, we'll be there from August the 5th all the way up through August the 14th. So I'll be back on the 15th here in the States, Lord willing. It's kind of crazy, but by this time next Sunday, I should be preaching in Unguja, Zanzibar, which is off the coast of Tanzania. It's crazy how you can go from one side of the world to the other, have slept, hopefully, and be rested up and all that kind of stuff. But that's the small world, you know, that we live in. And this is old hat for us at the circle because this will be our sixth trip to take to Tanzania. Uh, you know how this sort of works. But I just want to ask you to be praying with me and to be praying for me for our ministry. And uh, basically, Zanzibar, it's a part of Tanzania. It's an island, uh, but it was incorporated back in the early 60s. Tanganyika was the name of the country then. Zanzibar, the name of the island. So Tanganyika plus Zanzibar apparently equals Tanzania. They just combined the names. But ta Zanzibar is a little different than the mainland because it is Muslim majority. About 99% of the population are Muslims, whether they're practicing or just confessing Muslims. And I've never been in a ministry context quite like that before. Uh, the interior where we usually go is heavily Christianized, even if there's still a lot of people that don't know the gospel. So we're going to be dealing with a different kind of a culture and climate. And so we just need prayer and uplifting for wisdom on how to conduct ourselves within that kind of a context. Another thing I'm going to ask you to be praying for for our team is just for health. You know, as you travel there and back and as you're in the culture, I mean, there's a lot of different things that you can contract, you know, like along the way, a bug or a virus or something like that. You know, malaria is an ever-present reality in third world nations. So I would ask you to be just lifting us up and praying for us in terms of our health, that God sustains us and keeps us strong physically. And um, third, I would ask you to be praying too for God's continued provision. So praise God, we have been able to raise all the funds necessary for each of our team members to be able to go. Uh, so we have all of that taken care of. And what we've been doing presently is raising funds toward the meals that will be serving the pastors, the women, and the youth and the children that will be attending our ministry events. And we've sort of been planning on having about 500 to 600 individuals present total throughout the entire week. And we're looking at a cost of food roughly around the $8 range. And so we've been attempting to raise about $4,500 over the past couple of months to raise that support necessary for the food. And praise God, we're a little bit over $3,000 toward that goal. So we have a couple of more churches that are considering contributing. But I'm just appealing to you today as the circle. Over the next few weeks, we're also going to be receiving a love offering as a church to go towards the expenses to pay for meals. And basically, the meals are going to include mandazi, which is fried dough. It's like a donut. Um, almost like a beignet, but without the powdered sugar. It's a very, very sad thing, but it's really good. And then chai, which is the tea. It's got a little milk and sugar in it uh, because they love sugar over there. And then at lunch, we're going to be having rice, beans, and chicha, which is a spinach, and goat. Y'all up for some goat? I know some of you raised goats or have raised goats before. We're going to have some goat. But our prayer is that we can feed those that are coming because you don't, you don't have restaurants. You don't have people that can just pack up their lunch and bring it with them, many of them coming from a distance. So we have an obligation and a desire to feed those that come. So I just want to ask you to give generously above and beyond your tithe towards the cost of food and whatever's given is going to be used 100% to glorify God and to feed people. So be in prayer for me and our team as we go. Next week, Brother Jim Woodyear is going to be preaching for me. Uh, Jim is the associate pastor at Sand Hill Baptist Church, and he's got a heart of gold. He's a wonderful man. He's got a heart for the gospel. And so I ask you to be here and to listen attentively to him. And then the week after that, Brother J.T. Wright is going to be preaching for me. Uh, he's the youth minister at Freedom Baptist Church. And we love J.T. J.T. is awesome. 
Uh, he's been out before and helped us with our clothing ministry. Uh, we went on youth camp trip with him this year to Orange Beach, me and Wendy and the boys. And uh, we love JT and Hannah and their kids. So we've got the pulpit filled. We've got some great stuff on tap. And then when I get back that week after, we're going to be moving into a fall season of ministry. Got a lot of things on tap that we're planning and preparing for. And so just be praying for everything that God has in store. The other thing that I want us to pray for before we jump into our uh, time of talking about worship is I want us to be praying for our kids. Because in case you haven't noticed it, school's about to start back. Uh, we got teachers and kids that are going to be going back to school. These young ladies over here, right? Y'all are going back to school here soon. You excited about that? Yeah? Good. I'm glad you are. And then we got our homeschool kids, you know, us. We got the Gatlins, you know, they're going to be doing their thing. Scooter and Stacy and their crew, you know, they've got schools starting up, and we, we've all got that going on. And many of our college students will be beginning classes and things. And that, that's a big deal. You know, we're moving out of summer and moving into a, a new season of school. And so I just want us to be lifting that up as well. So let's come before the Lord today briefly and just pray over these things, and then we're going to get into the Word of God together. Lord, we just thank you for the day that you have made. Father, we rejoice in it, and we are glad in it. We want to praise you and thank you today for your goodness to us. We praise you that you made a way for us when there was no way. When we were stuck in the pit, you raised us up. And Father, we are here today as your church, one body in Christ, because of what we sang about a moment ago, the goodness of God. It's your goodness that chased us down. It's your goodness that sustains us. And it's your goodness that is going to help us to hold fast even until the end. And Father, we go on mission for you and with you because you call us to. As you, Father, sent the Son, and as, Father, you and your Son sent the Spirit, even so now you send us. You say to go and disciple all the nations, to baptize and to teach obedience to all your commands, promising that you're always with us, even to the very ends of the age, and we're going to claim today, even to the very ends of the earth. So, Father, as we go to Tanzania, and as the hearts of this people go with us, I pray, Father, that you would bless the ministry. We lift up Enoch and Philista, our guides. We lift up Lucas Anthony, our host. We lift up all the pastors that are there in Zanzibar, doing the hard work of church planting in a Muslim-majority nation, an area that is in some ways hostile to the gospel, certainly does not desire to see the name of Christ grow. And yet they are there working and laboring tirelessly under difficult conditions. And our goal is to encourage them, to equip them, and to partner with them in that ongoing work. So I pray, Father, you keep us safe physically. I pray, Father, that you fill us with your spirit, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge that we need, that love would be the perfect bond of unity. Father, we lift up the fundraising efforts that we've been engaged in. Father, we know that every dollar is needed to make sure that people that are coming from a long distance and do not have the means are fed so that they are nourished, not only with the word of God, but also with nutritious food. And I just pray that you'd move on the hearts of our people to give whatever they're able to. And for those who do not have it to give, we pray your blessing upon them. Father, that you would just provide their needs as you meet the needs of others around the world. Lord, we also lift up our children to you. We lift up our youth. We lift up those who are in college and are going to be starting back school here soon. By the time I get back, most of these things are going to be in play. So we just ask, Father, that it's a great school year. We ask protection over our schools. We know that it is not a given that schools are always a safe place. In many parts of our country, especially, Father, there are just difficulties right now in our communities, in our country, and even in our schools. We pray for your protection. Keep our kids safe. Keep our teachers safe. And we pray that as they work, that they would learn, that they would grow, that they would be built up in character. Father, I pray now as we open up your word today, that it would open up our eyes, that we could see the incredible things that you have for us in your word. We love you so much, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's turn to Psalm, Psalm 40, chap, uh, chapter 40 today. The 40th Psalm, as we talk about this theme of worship. Psalm 40, we're going to read a few verses and then see what the Lord has 
to say to us today. A Psalm of David. I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and will trust in the Lord. How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and has not turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse into falsehood. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. This is God's word to us today. Today, as we pray about and as we think about the issue of worship and the opportunity to worship God, I want us to understand that this is the most precious gift that God has given us as a church. As we've talked about our core values, we've mentioned prayer and we've mentioned community and we've mentioned service. But I want you to understand today that our prayers are hollow, our community is empty, and our service has no value if God does not inhabit it. Worship is the acknowledgement of the presence of God in our lives. And that's something that we too often miss. It can be so easy to miss the fact that God is with us. He's always there. And that the place where God is, is by default, holy ground. Moses didn't realize it. When he saw the bush being burned and it was not being consumed, it took an oracle of God to say, remove your sandals, because this is holy ground. When Joshua saw the captain of the host of the Lord, the angel said the same thing to him. Take off your sandals, because you, Joshua, are standing on holy ground. When Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, the place where he was standing was holy ground. Everywhere where the presence of God meets us is holy and everywhere where God meets us becomes a tabernacle, a sanctuary. It becomes the very house of God. Just like Jacob, when he was at Bethel, saw the angels of God ascending and descending on a ladder to and from the heavens and said, this is surely the house of God, and I did not know it. That is us. Many of us can easily go through our day, go through our week with the blinders on, unaware unthinking, not because we're being necessarily willfully ignorant, but can be so easy to forget that God is there. And where God is, there exists the opportunity to worship. And we can easily confine our worship to the times that we meet. Like we said in the video, to the songs, to the rituals, the practices, all those customs. I mean, this is our time of worship. This is the time that we set aside to worship God. But actually, worship it is a lifestyle, it is a walk, it is a journey with God. It is a 168-hour-a-week, 365-day-of-the-year. I mean, it's an all-the-time sort of a thing. All of life is an opportunity to worship God. The thing is that those things that are closest to us become the most familiar and oftentimes the most invisible. I mean, you don't notice what's just sort of always there. You kind of take it for granted that it's always there. So the challenge as a believer is to live in that constant awareness of God's presence so that you can always take full advantage of the opportunities that exist to worship him. And so today, as we think about worship, I want to encourage you to think about your worship in terms that might be relatable. Because the Bible says God's spirit. And, you know, I've never seen a spirit before. I mean, I can imagine in my mind what spirit might be. But all we know is that spirit, it's not physical. And since everything we see is physical, we can only understand by analogy, by saying, well, this is like this. As a spirit, God is like wind. As spirit, God is like fire. As spirit, God is like oil. As spirit, God is like water. You know, he's sort of like these things, but he's not these things. God is everywhere. All of his being, fully contained in all places, at all times. It's this mystery that we can't fully grasp, and yet we accept it by faith. And worship has to do with our response to the divine, our response to the presence of this invisible, 
amazing, incomprehensible, yet very real and tangible and near God. And so today, as we think about how to worship God, as we think about how to approach God, I want you to think about it in three physical terms that can help you to grasp this spiritual reality. The first is the idea of standing. The next is the idea of kneeling. And the third is the idea of falling. Let's think in these terms today of standing, of kneeling, and of falling. And we saw it in the passage of Scripture that we just read a moment ago. Because the writer David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined to me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the pit of destruction, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, making my footsteps firm. If you are here today and you know the Lord, then here's what he's done for you. He has pulled you up off of the mat. The Bible says that we were all sinking in the mire of sin. But God, who is rich in mercy reached out and took hold of us. And he lifted us up just as he lifted Peter, who was sinking in the water. And he set our feet, the Bible says, on a rock, on sure ground. This is what God has done for us. This is his action on our behalf. This is what we call salvation. Salvation is not you turning over a new leaf or trying harder. It's not you doing better Salvation is God doing something new for you that you could not do. And this for David is where it all began. And this is where it begins for us. You can't worship a God that you've not met. You can't worship a God who has not first met with you. But the Bible says that in Christ, God has reached out to us. He has made himself known. And now in response to God, we have that opportunity to worship him. This God who has picked us up and enabled us to stand. And worship comes in these three ways. In this standing, which is actually a leaping, in this kneeling, and then finally, in this falling. David says in verse 3 that God put a new song in his mouth. A song of praise to our God. He says, many will see and fear and they will trust in the Lord. You know, when David met with God, it caused him to praise. It caused him to thank him. It caused him to extol. It's like, I can't keep quiet about this. This was just too good to shut up about. And this is what God does. God's goodness is not measured. God's goodness is immeasurable. God's goodness does not come in degree. God's goodness comes in full. And when God's goodness comes, it overflows. It fills us to the point of overflowing. And the result of that is a praise. The result of that is an up-leaping. The result of that is a springing up. It's sort of like when I'm watching a sports event. And, you know, I'm sort of watching this game, and everything's sort of going the way I expect it to. And then all of a sudden, the unexpected happens. It's like the most amazing catch I've ever seen, the most amazing home run, the most amazing curveball. And sometimes when you see those things, what it causes you to do is without even thinking about it, you just, ah, you know, you just leap up out of your seat. You cannot stay seated because this is too amazing. And the response of worship is not just a decision. It's not just a choice, but it begins with an impulse, something from inside of us. It's this springing up in our hearts. It's sort of like this story that I love in the book of Acts. As Peter is going into the temple one day to pray, he notices a guy sitting at the entrance, and this guy has been lame, lame from birth. And as Peter walks by, the guy looks up at Peter because he's begging for alms. And Peter looks, and he has nothing to give. But at the same time, he wanted to give him something. And so the man looks at him with expectation, and Peter says, I don't have silver and gold to give you, but what I have I give in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, walk. And then he reaches down and takes hold of the man's arm, and he lifts him. And the Bible tells us that the man's feet and ankles were strengthened, and he stood. But not only did he stand, here's what it says in verse 8, with a leap he stood upright. And he began to walk. And he entered the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. 
Now, some people can jump and some people can't. Like if I try to jump, I'm not going to get very high. Some people have got a lot of spring. But here's something that happens in your life when you meet with God. You just leap. There's something inside of you that just is uplifted. It's like the burden is there and it's weighing you down. And now all of a sudden, your heart is light. There was despair and now there's joy. There was grief and now there is comfort. God takes all of this. And he gives us a spirit of refreshment and of lightness. And it causes us to leap. And this is a spiritual thing. Because when Jesus is talking to the woman at the well, he speaks to her about a drink. He says, would you give me something to drink? And then he says to her, if you knew the gift of God, you would ask me and I would give you living water. And this living water would become in you a fountain leaping up to eternal life. You see, this leaping that we have in response to God's presence is not just what comes as a result of getting hyped up. It's not because of the beat. It's not because of the vibe. It's not because of the energy of the crowd. But it's because God puts something deep inside of us that is itself leaping. And that is God's spirit God's spirit is alive, he is living, and he is active. When God puts that spirit in you, when he puts that fountain in you, that well in you, it is bubbling, it is springing, it is coming forth, and you can't contain it. It's sort of like David who danced before the Lord with all of his might. And when he was chided for it by his wife, he says, I'll become even more dishonored than this because I am going to worship my God. Worship, the response to God, begins with this. It begins with God's Spirit. As God pours out His Spirit into our hearts, and that response, that primal spiritual response, is this leaping, this upwelling, this rising up in me that I cannot contain, that I cannot control, and the natural outcome of that is praise. So my question for you today, is the Spirit present in your life in this active way, in this invigorating way, in this rejuvenating way, or is your faith a very measured faith? It's like I'm sort of getting out about as much as I'm putting in. The faith that we have is not one where we just get as much out of it as we put in, but we get as much out of it as God has put into us. And as we open ourselves to the Spirit, this is our response. We leap up for God. We stand up for God because he brings us to our feet. But then, the next stage, the next step in our experience of worship, it goes from leaping to kneeling, from leaping to kneeling. And we read this in Psalm 40, verse 4. Not only did God put a new song in David's mouth, the song of praise, but David says, How blessed is the man who has made the Lord his trust and hasn't turned to the proud, nor to those who lapse into falsehood. So here we go from leaping to kneeling. Now here's the thing about excitement and energy. Excitement and energy will take you so far, but it won't take you all the way. What it takes to make it all the way is it takes devotion. This leaping, this uplifting that God puts into your heart has got to be directed. And this is where the message of the gospel is so very important. The presence of the Spirit is real and he fills our heart. But the Bible says that we're most truly transformed by the renewal of of our mind. And as believers, here is the mind God gives us. He gives us the mind of Christ. And with the mind of Christ, we experience the very thoughts of God, the very counsels of God, the very mysteries of God, which are all revealed to us in his word. The revealed things belong to us, the hidden things to our God. But God reveals truth to us in his word. And so worship is not just this continual, ongoing experience of leaping in which you sort of finally get exhausted, but instead, as you leap, you find yourself coming to your knees before God 
as you look at the beauty of your Savior, as you realize who it is that has given you this gift and the price that he paid, the high cost at which it came, it came at a tremendous price, his very life. And when I see that this joy I have came at great grief, what that does is it brings me to my knees. And I begin to say with Isaiah the prophet, woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of glory. I want to ask you today, when was the last time that God's presence, his spirit brought you to your feet? And when was the last time that a vision of your Savior brought you to your knees? Whereas you considered the cross, as you considered his suffering and his sacrifice, all you could do was kneel in wonder and amazement that Jesus would love you so very much. What do we do in God's presence in response? We leap. He brings us to our feet. We kneel. He brings us to our knees. But finally, we fall. We fall. It says there in Psalms, again, chapter 40, verse 5. Here's how David concludes. He says, Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts toward us. There is none to compare with you. If I would declare and speak of them, they would be too numerous to count. I want you to see the progression here in David's life. First of all, God, not David, but God, lifted him out of the miry clay and set his feet on a rock. That is the gift of grace. In response, David worshiped. His heart leapt with praise to God. And then in response to God's goodness, he honored God with a devoted life where he spent his life before his Lord on his knees saying, not me, but you. But see here how he ends. He ends in sheer amazement and wonder. Many, O Lord my God, are the wonders which you have done and your thoughts toward us. There's none to compare with you. Here's the thing. The more you honor Christ, the more you follow Christ, the more you fall before him on your knees in devotion to him, you begin to realize just how lacking your devotion is. It's like as devoted as I feel like I am, as far as it feels like I'm willing to go, God is so much greater. God is so much bigger than anything that I could ever feel, anything that I could ever will. He is beyond searching out. And there are moments in our lives when God not only brings us to our feet in praise, he not only brings us to our knees in honor and reverence, but he causes us to fall on our face. There are times in God's presence when you just cannot get low enough. It's like, I can't fall any farther than this, but the weight of the glory of God is so great that it presses you in your heart into the very dust. You're not crushed by his greatness, but it's pressing on you and pushing on you because you feel the weight and the immensity of this great God that you serve. I know that prostration is not a very common posture for us in our worship, but it is so very common all through scripture. Time and time and time again, we see this phrase, he fell on his face before the Lord. It begins with Abraham. And the very last person in scripture that is recorded who fell at his face is John in the book of Revelation. It says, I fell at his feet to worship him. This is the angelic messenger. But then the messenger said to me, don't do that. I'm a fellow servant of yours and your brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Instead, here is what you are to do. Worship God. Our worship is the most intense. Our worship is the most involved. Not just when we're leaping, not just when we're kneeling, but when we, under the weight of God, realize that he is so far and high above me that the best place for me to be is face down before him. And as I close, 
I want to give you an illustration to show you how this is a position of honor and not a position of dishonor. Because there's something about the idea of falling on your face before another with your nose, so to speak, to the ground that can sound kind of demeaning. In the ancient world, the only person that would fall face down before someone else would be the vanquished in the face of the person who had triumphed over him. If a king conquered another king, the defeated king would come in his presence and be like, face down, prostrating himself, casting himself at the mercy of the other, and basically saying, I'm not just your servant, I'm your slave, I'm nothing, I am but dust, I have been conquered and defeated. This is what God did to the serpent. Remember the serpent in the Garden of Eden? What was the punishment for the serpent? God cursed him in this way. He said, on your belly you will go all the days of your life and you will eat dust. Basically, the way God punished the serpent is by casting him down on the ground, on his belly, prostrate before him. And there's coming a day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And for those who are anti-Christ, for those who are opposed to him, it will look like such a vanquishing. And when we read here about these prophets and these seers and these visionaries falling face down before God, we can sort of think, especially in the age of equality and individualism and liberty, that sounds so like antiquated. That sounds so demeaning. But let me show you what God does for those who humble themselves in the presence of the Lord. Turn to Daniel 9. Then we're going to jump into our time of prayer. Daniel chapter 9. I'm sorry, chapter 10. Verse 9. So Daniel is one of these seers. He's one of these visionaries. If you want to read about the oracles and the visions that God gave Daniel, you need to read it. You need to look at it. It's amazing. But Daniel chapter 10, a word, a prophetic word comes to Daniel. And here is his response. It says, I heard the sound of his words. I would be Daniel. His would be the voice of the heavenly messenger. I heard the sound of his words. And as soon as I heard the sound of his words, I fell into a deep sleep on my face with my face to the ground. So notice the posture in which Daniel finds himself. In the presence of the divine, with the weight of the Almighty pressing down on him, all he can do is fall down, prostrate before his Lord and before his King. But notice what happens. Then behold, a hand touched me, and he set me trembling on my hands and knees. And he said to me, O oh, Daniel, man of high esteem, understand the words that I'm about to tell you, and stand upright, for I have now been sent to you. And when he had spoken this word to me, I stood up, trembling. Those who find themselves prostrate before the Lord in amazement and wonder at his greatness, saying, Who am I? Experience this. A hand on their shoulder, a word being spoken over them, and gently lifting you to your hands, to your knees, and then inviting you in the presence of the Holy One to stand. Because I've not called you my slave. I've called you my son. You're my son. You're my daughter. You're my child. So here's what I want you to do. Child, I want you to stand here with me. But here's the difference. Whereas before, it was done simply with this exuberance, which is wonderful. Now that exuberance is filled with a reverence and an awe, a fear and a trembling. Not that comes about because God might reject me, but fear and trembling at the reality that he has accepted me. I get to stand with him. I have wrestled with God and won. I've come face to face with the divine. 
and my life has not been extinguished. As we worship God, as we fall before him, he lifts us up. And to a people who live in a world that is always encouraging you to lift yourself, to exalt yourself, to promote yourself, to further yourself, God presents something countercultural. Humble yourself. Lower yourself. Think less about yourself. Think of yourself the way I do. And as you do that, you're going to experience worship. And that worship will animate your prayers. That worship will unite and unify your community. That worship will empower your service. Church, it all begins with worship. We are nothing without him. And so I want to invite you today to join me in prayer. And I want you to think about what we've said. Today we stand, not because of our doing, but by his doing. And as we stand, we leap. The spirit of God who is in us bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And that causes us to dance, to rejoice. We cannot be silent. We will not be quiet. I want you to take a moment in your prayers and thank God for raising you to your feet and for setting your feet upon a rock. Consider the mire that you were in. Think about the fear that you were living in, the guilt, the condemnation, the shame, the doubt, and the hesitation. And see how far God has brought you. Let's take a moment and thank God that he has brought us this far. And we know that if he's begun that work, He'll complete it. Thank him for the place that he's brought you from. And now ask God to help you to open your mouth. He said to the prophet Ezekiel, eat the scroll. And when Ezekiel did so, he found that the words were as sweet as honey. And he shared those words with the people. God has given you a testimony. You were lame and now you walk. You were blind and now you see. You were dead, and now you're alive. How can we keep such good news to ourselves? Ask God to give you boldness and confidence to make his praises known to others. We not only leap before our Lord today, but we kneel. As we reflect on what Jesus has done for us, we cannot but fall on our knees before him and call him Lord. He is master. He is savior. And he is friend. How great the Father's love toward us. Take a moment right now and thank Jesus for being obedient 
to the will of his Father for coming and dying for you. Jesus loves us so much that if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us. All of us are perfect insofar as we're in Christ. And yet, we still struggle. Sin is still very much a pull. What sin do you need to confess to your Lord today? What are your struggles? He doesn't condemn you for them. He offers you forgiveness if you'll ask. Confess your sin to him today. encourage you now to resolve in your heart that you will take time this week to revisit the presence of God, to make time for him. It doesn't have to be long, but to take a moment in your day and to get on your knees and to remind yourself of who you are and whose you are. His mercies are new every day. Let's live in those mercies. As our hearts leap, we kneel. But there are times in our kneeling where we just fall. We fall before him because the weight of his glory is so great, so vast, so immense. We need to see God for who he is, high and lifted up. Ask God today to open the eyes of your heart to be able to see him by faith for who he is. As we meet God on the mountaintop, he doesn't leave us there. Jesus was transfigured, and he came back down. Moses met with God and came down. But it was different. They were radiant. Moses had to wear a veil. The disciples had to cover their eyes because the radiance of God was so great. 
Those who fall before the Lord are raised different, changed. And the Bible says that we are the light of the world. This is the light we are, the light that shines in us is God's glory, God's greatness. Let's not hide it, church. Let's allow our light so to shine that men might see our good works and glorify our Father who is in heaven. Father, we thank you today that you meet with your people. You renew your people. You restore us. You revive us. It all begins with you. You lift us up and you make us stand.